We're going to go ahead and start the tape, and I'm going to ask that you turn to the book of First Peter. First Peter, chapter one, and in a moment we're going to look at verse number uh, twenty-four. This is part number four of the final installment of the three best Christmas tree ornaments. We've studied quite a bit on the negative aspects of Christmas, and uh, I did something this evening just to show that not all symbols are wrong. Uh, I have, through some friends, uh, a gift that I'm wearing, and it's the Star of David. And uh, the Star of David is um, the symbol of dimensions in doctrine uh, because uh, it's the symbol of God, the circle, and then uh, the Star of David. You also have one, the one cell concept, there's one God. But you also have the concept of the atom. If you've ever seen a picture of an atom, this is what it looks like, only it's simply flattened out with the Star of David. But uh, it symbolizes power and so forth. Uh, that symbol is worn by the nation of Israel on its flag, and it's not wrong. A cross is not wrong. These things remind us of certain things, and so no, not all ornaments are wrong, nor are all dangling earrings. <laughs> uh, we wouldn't dare rob you ladies of those things. But there are, that's, what's our, that's our point, some things that are wrong. We vividly portrayed the fact that in ancient times, people wore their gods in their ears. And they simply took them off and put them on the tree when they couldn't get to church, and yet they wanted to ask these gods for a special favor. And it is our contention that Santa Claus is one of those idols. He is worn, he is recognized, he is prayed to, he has asked for things, he is venerated, he is a saint by the Roman Catholic standards, he's offered food and drink, all of these things were done to the idol gods of ancient times. But now, be that as it may, the Bible clearly and especially identifies certain uh, ornaments um, I should have put these, uh, these symbols or ornaments which should be associated with the tree. No, that sentence is right. The Bible clearly and especially uh, identifies those symbols and ornaments which should be associated with the tree. Now the tree that we're talking about is the cross. Uh, for some reason I'm, I've got dyslexia again or simply forgetfulness. I forgot to put a word in there. You'll forgive me. I don't know what it is. My mind must be going. But um, in 1 Peter, uh, and, and again, I've got the wrong scripture verse listed. Now this is, this is where this is going to go here. Maybe I'm just in the wrong uh, book. Let's go to chapter 2 in 1 Peter, verse 24. Now, now we're talking. Okay. Perhaps I'm just so anxious to get through all of this material in one service that I, uh, I left out some things. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 24, the cross is called the tree. And there are reasons for this. Verse 24, it says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Now, why in the world would the cross be called a tree? Yes, it was made out of wood. It was a tree in essence, stripped of its bark and leaves and so forth. But the answer to that is, God is going to associate it with the two other important trees essential to the angelic conflict. The two other important trees in the Bible. 
And these are found, of course, in the book of Genesis, chapter 2. The book of Genesis, chapter 2. The illustration that we have here actually gives us the three essential trees to the Bible and the angelic conflict. Verse number 9, Genesis 2. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. But I want you to see that the other trees, though they're important and you can enjoy them, the two main trees that God had in mind in the garden were the tree of, the, uh, the tree of life, which was in the midst of the garden, and also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, this tree, the cross, becomes the third and most important tree of all when you're talking about trees. First of all, the tree of life should be translated lives, and it has to do with God giving life, body, soul, and spirit to those who ate of the tree. It not only gave them life, it sustained the life God made originally. The tree of deaths. In verse number 17 it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. The problem with this, as we have gone over many times, surely is moose in the Hebrew, and die is moose in the Hebrew. It's doubled. So it literally should be translated, dying thou shalt die. Dying spiritually and immediately, thou shalt die physically and eventually. But then we come to the cross, where there are two issues. Jesus Christ didn't just die on the cross. He had deaths on the cross. He died a spiritual death in essence when God the Father and the Spirit abandoned him. And of course then he became sin for us uh, in that sense. And then he died physically. After he said it is finished he gave up the ghost. So he had deaths on the cross. Now why did he die those deaths? So that he could restore or rectify the deaths associated with the uh, tree of deaths. Uh, when, when Adam sinned, he killed his human spirit and his body began to die. And of course, the soul without God will be isolated in hell and the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So Jesus Christ had to die all of these deaths on behalf of sinful man in order to restore their lives. And of course, we've studied that the first thing the cross does is regenerate our human spirit. It, uh, it enlivens us by neutralizing the old sin nature, and then we're in full fellowship with God. Okay. So, now we have to come and see, under this point, point eight, that the things clearly identified with the trees and especially the tree, the cross, are three, how shall we say, uh, wiggly things. Three things that you perhaps would not want living in your basement, attic, or running free as a pet in your home, though I understand there are some people that have them. The first ornament, if you want to put up a Christmas tree ornament, should be that of a python. Never heard of that before, have you? You haven't because Christianity has remained ignorant of the Word of God. The python is that snake which symbolizes good and evil, Satan's original policy, or should we put it more specifically, Lucifer. He became Satan and the devil. There are actually things that modify this name Lucifer. His proper name is Lucifer. But the word here in verse number one of Genesis chapter three says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. Now the word Hebrew, nakash, means the hissing one and so forth, serpent or snake, but it's a generic term. The context decides, and we're going to see in just a little bit uh, how, with uh, about six points, 
we know this is a python. First of all, a python is the king of snakes. Lucifer was the head or the king of the angels. Now the king of kings is Jesus Christ. But you have to keep in mind that originally before the fall, Jesus Christ delegated authority to angels. That's why we have archangels and so forth, all the way down the line to the rank and file. So let's turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, and note that Lucifer, as a python, python can grow to up to 30 feet. It is the biggest, longest, and most powerful, physically, of the land serpents. Just as the lion could be called king of beasts, the, the python could be called the king of snakes, and Lucifer was the king or the head of the angels. Verse 12, you seal up the sum, last part of verse 12, full of wisdom, you're perfect in beauty. You've been in Eden, the garden of God, and it describes everything that uh, he had by way of his coloring. Verse 14, you're the anointed cherub that covereth. He was the best. He was the most powerful. He had the most authority within the ranks of the angels. Next to the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the sovereign of creation. So with these particular verses, we find that Lucifer as such was the king represented in the python. Secondly, we're still here in Ezekiel 28, pythons are known for falling upon their prey from tree limbs. Now uh, we have a fisherman here uh, who goes down to Kentucky Lake and takes his boat out there and as he's rowing he watches the trees because there are other snakes that uh, crawl up the trees and fall out into the boats. And then that's when you abandon ship. And it's funny how uh, a, a little snake can, can toss a big man right overboard. That's right. He, uh, it's a miracle. He just tippy toes to shore. But they are known for being up in the trees and falling on their prey from above as Lucifer pounced on the angelic and human creations. Now again, we will read other verses in the book of Genesis a little bit later, but in verse number 18, it says, you have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your traffic. He was the head man, and the trafficking means he came down upon the angels. He went through the rank and file. He pounced on them, as it were. And in fact, in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 2, he is called that old serpent. But there are certain reasons why this particular serpent is a python. He symbolizes, of course, point one, the king of the angels as the king of snakes. He did what Lucifer did in coming from above down upon his prey as the biggest and most powerful. Thirdly, pythons conquer their victims by overpowering them, then enveloping them, and then suffocating them. Literally, they squeeze out the very breath of life. Now, this is exactly what Lucifer did in the garden. If you'll turn back to the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7. God, just shortly before the incident of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, verse 7 says, God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Again, life there should be lives. It's in the plural. And in chapter 3, verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you'll not surely die. Now, what was going to die? The lives God had just instilled in them. For God does know in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened, you'll be as God's knowing good and evil. So, 
Here is the concept. Lucifer as the python wrapped around the body. Now what do they do? It's wrapped around the body. That animal has to breathe or that human being has to breathe. And every time it exhales, the serpent tightens up just a little bit. And in effect, it becomes a vice where you simply cannot inhale that last breath. Now, some say that they crush their victims and the smaller ones they do. But for the bigger ones, they simply squeeze the breath of life out of them. What did Lucifer do on that tree? You're not going to die. And he tightens it. Oh, eat it. You're not going to die. Believe it. And he tightens. And eventually, they could not breathe the breath of lives that they were having sustained by the tree of lives. So, he was killing their body, and in essence, just as um, you need oxygen to go through the heart and lungs back to the brain, and here is the, the situation where the brain dies and the soul leaves, that's what happens spiritually. He wrapped around them, and the body was dying, and the human spirit died. So there is the correlation there. As this python tightens its grip, okay, just the, the brain here is equivalent to the human spirit, uh, the, the heart and lungs to the, the life of the body and the brain, and uh, then the body there, you can see what he was doing in, the, in symbolic fashion. He was squeezing the breath of lives from them. In particular, the life of the spirit. Now, point number four. This was a python because pythons are non-venomous. Now, I want you to understand something. Sin was not part of Lucifer's original plan. Sin corrupts, but he wanted, he wants to counterfeit God, so he therefore can't have anything that corrupts. A python is non-venomous. Yes, it does squeeze the life out of people, but Satan's plan of good and evil means we leave God out, but we keep our good bodies. Uh, get rid of God, kill him, but we have health and prosperity and welfare and so forth. So, non-venomous, we don't corrupt, oh, God, he says, uh, sure, I don't have my creature spirit, but you're not going to hurt this beautiful body. And God said, oh, yes, I am, because sin causes that. But good and evil does not want to have corruption in the body. They don't care about the spirit, but they want health in the body. So, here is this python, non-venomous. He did not poison or corrupt the bodies of their victims so that they can ingest them. Now, if a python bit their victims and had poison, they eat their victims whole. Where would that poison go? Into the body of the one who just bit them. That's why the python doesn't bite them just crushes the life out of them, then eats them whole, and they do not ingest their own poison back into their bodies. Lucifer wants all of his victims, he wants to surround them and say, you're mine, I caught you. But he doesn't want any corruption in them to cause his own system or his own body any problem. So this is a python. But 2.17 says, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So, the illustration is, is simply this. Uh, it's a python, we know, because they di he didn't ingest, or excuse me, inject any poison into his victim. And the reason was he didn't want that poison to then, as he began to digest, enter his own system. The python symbolizes good and evil. Leave God out but keep the good of creation. He wants a counterfeit kingdom. He wants to duplicate God. Everything but have God there. Every, the good things about creation, he wants to keep. And so Satan will incorporate as much good as he possibly can into his system that are compatible with his own plans. He doesn't want the corruption, but he wants God out at the same time. Back to the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 28. Now, for those who say, well, 
didn't, didn't Lucifer as well cause sin and corruption? Yes, he did, but that wasn't part of his plan. He wasn't going to make a plan and say, I'm going to get rid of God, but at the same time, I'm going to hurt this beautiful body. Good and evil means evil out with God. Good means I keep my body. All right, chapter 28, verse 15. Uh, where it says, You were perfect till iniquity was found in you. They have filled the midst of you with violence and you sinned. All right, now, because you sinned, your policy was to get me out and keep your body, but now there's another factor that's come in here. See, the, 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 uh, the python doesn't want the corruption in the body of its victim so that it can have its victim uh, it's cake and eat it too, as it were. It can have its victim and digest it, uh, but at uh, the same time not have any poison to come back into its own system. So uh, it says, it's filled you with violence and you sinned. I will cast thee as profane, profane, corrupted, poisoned from the mountain of God. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom. I'll cast you to the ground. You've defiled your sanctuaries. All of those are terms of, of a, someone being bitten with poison and having um, toxic effects in their system. Okay? Two more things with regard to this point. This was a python. In that tree, because pythons swallow their victims whole as Lucifer did, to the human race. A uh, couple verses of scripture to prove that, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Get it? You're dead. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in all the children of disobedience. Every person that was born in Adam is part of Satan's kingdom. He is brought in as a child of disobedience. And for as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, they are spiritually dead and they're dying physically, but at the same time they are part of Lucifer's kingdom, among whom we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The whole human race has been brought into Lucifer's kingdom at that point. Now, he doesn't control them all as he, was, he would like, but they are all his. Turn to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. Those that are part of God's family have been brought out of the kingdom of Satan. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Verse 19, and we know that we are of God, but the whole world lieth in wickedness. Uh, you could say lies in the lap of, or is being digested in the belly of that old serpent, Lucifer. And lastly, as we turn back to the book of Ezekiel chapter 28, they have the vestige of legs, only now to forever eat dust as a punishment like Lucifer. Now I tried to make these sentences or statements and points concise. Of all of the snakes, if you investigate them, the one who is said to have had legs at one time a place for legs, uh, an organ there that, uh, that could uh, have at one time been stretched to make legs so that they could stand upright. Of all of the snakes, the python has them. Now, they're called vestigial organs now, they're just the remains of legs. They now have to walk on the ground. Why? Ezekiel 28, middle part of the verse, 
I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth. It was the judgment of Lucifer. Quickly, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 15. Thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. In the last part of verse 19, thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. Last part, you'll go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under foot. His beautiful body is now made ashes. And of course, that was the fate of this python. It could stand upright in the garden. It had legs. It could walk. No, it could talk. It could <laughs> crawl on his belly like a reptile. And you, that's a carnival. Barker says that. Back to Genesis chapter 3. By the way, uh, I've decided to uh, name our python Monty just to give you something to, uh, just to think about there. Verse 13. The woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle, above the beast of the field. Upon your belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of your life. A python had legs. God took his legs from him. And he now, that one that stood up, now has to crawl. Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. If you want a Christmas ornament, the next thing you have to have is a fiery serpent. Now I want you to see that the fiery serpent is not part of the original tree, but it's associated with the original tree. It's made to be. We'll see that in a moment. Verse 4 of Numbers 21. They journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea. They were discouraged and they began to complain against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Uh, there's no bread, there's no water, and we hate this light bread. Uh, <laughs> we would say ditto. Uh, we want the real stuff. But uh, in today's diet conscious society, we have to have light bread. Okay, they, there was the manna, by the way. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord. We pray, take the serpents away. Pray for us to the Lord. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Okay, this time, the fiery serpent is a seraph, root seraphim, the burning angels, an order of the angelic creation. But used in this sense, it is a burning serpent. Now, we, of course, find this as you hold your place and turn to the book of Psalms 140. Psalms 140, verse 3. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. All right? Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 23. Verse 32. It's speaking of drunkenness and wine. But the point is, at the last, it bites like a serpent. It stings like an adder. Now, the seraph, or this adder, was named for its copper or brass color and for, for its burning and stinging bite. It was very inflammatory. Very, very painful death. Now, here again is what, what happened. Remember, the python doesn't want to inject its prey with corruption because it wants to eat it, bring it into its own system, as Lucifer does. 
But God said, you have iniquity, that's your policy, and it's filled you with violence, that is the intent, and thou hast sinned. Okay, so the python represents the policy, but the sin represents the action of the devil, and that, of course, causes corruption. The bite of the poison goes in here. It goes through the, the system of the heart, and this time, instead of taking away the breath, the oxygen, and killing its victim, now it kills its victim because of poison. And it goes into the brain, and the brain dies, and the whole system becomes corrupt with poison. Good and evil doesn't want poison. That's the non-venomous python. But it does want God out, so it squeezes the life out, but preserves the body. But as a byproduct, you, <laughs> you have to have uh, sin causes corruption. You can't leave God. You must make a choice with your volition. And that, of course, means that in your body, which you had a, uh, which wasn't a sin nature, but you have motions of sins that come, come up, and your volition grabbed onto that, and uh, lust comes back in, the volition grabs a hold of it, that's sin, and sin, says James, when it is finished, causes death. And there goes the brain, and out goes the soul. But the picture is this. Lucifer, because of sin, though he didn't, didn't want sin, bit his victims. They became corrupt in their body. That's the first thing God did was curse their bodies in the ground. Next thing they, they did was defile their sanctuaries like he did, and their human spirit died. There's the correlation again. You take the physical as to what happened symbolically then to, uh, symbolically and actually to the spiritual. All right, now, come with me to Ezekiel. Or, well, let's, let's just stay right here because of my, my time. Let's, let's stay right here. Verse number 8 says this. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looks upon it shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, here's the point. Only the python was on the tree originally. The adder is basically a ground-crawling snake. Though it can, it has potential for tree climbing. But notice what God did. Take it from the ground. Remember our original study? The point is, when the material rules the, the physical, when the, uh, you give life to the material, and it, it, it takes over your soul, that's poison, that's corruption. So the adder was then brought up to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's good and evil here, G on this side, E on this side, but what happened was, Lucifer didn't count on sin. And God must send punishment to sin. Sin causes corruption. So that no matter how much you want God out of your life, uh, no matter how much good you do, as long as you've got the problem of sin, you've got corruption. So you kick God out and you're spiritually dead, but God in effect then has to cause you physical death. That's because of sin. So the adder was brought up from the ground and he was put into the tree as symbolized by take him from the ground and put him on a pole. Now, of course, we've got the cross represented here as well. How do we know? John chapter 3. John chapter 3. So if you want a second Christmas ornament, you need to put a poisonous snake up there because he now is said to be on the tree and the ultimate tree, the cross, is going to consider all three of these beasts, as it were, and wiggly things. On the cross, now, on this pole, evil cannot be considered if you want a cure, because the only cure to sin, or the bite of the serpent, was God's solution. Get the point? Evil means leave God out. 
God, but uh, spirituality means you bring God in. The only solution to the problem of the bite of the serpent was in that snake on the pole. Good. How could they, good? They were all bitten. They were all falling out. They were, they were dying there. They couldn't get. The only thing they could do was look. Can man save himself by human good? He cannot. The re, we have a world of relig, religious people who are doing good works to save themselves, and they're bitten with this, with this adder that places them flat on their back. They, they are incapable. We're totally depraved. But there is one thing we can do. We can volitionally look. That is faith. So evil is rejected by that serpent. Good is rejected by that serpent. And of course the serpent now represents the corruption of sin, the old sin nature, and sins that are committed. And the brass is a symbol of the medal of judgment. God judged the serpent on the pole rather than the people who were bitten. He cured them but focused his wrath upon the brazen serpent. Now, John chapter 3, Jesus Christ says, verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The serpent was put on the cross. The python is there, good and evil, but they're rejected. Good and evil never made Jesus Christ succumb. That python never crushed Jesus Christ. He held him at bay. He rejected good and evil as a means uh, or as a lifestyle, a viable lifestyle, uh, alternate to that of God. But on the cross, God the Father focused the punishment of our sins on him. He was made the sin offering for us. He was made the brazen serpent so that we might not have to have the corruption of sin in our lives. All right? Quickly, ornament number three, Psalms 22. We have three very similar type of beasts. Now we have a worm, or actually a, an insect as such, but it's considered a worm with, as a larva and so forth. The Messianic Psalm, verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Jesus Christ said that. It's recorded, the first part of it, on the cross of Calvary. Now please remember this verse because in a minute it's going to make a whole lot of impact on your life. Now though we don't have these words recorded as the seven famous sayings of Christ from the cross, he did think it. What did he think? I am a worm, verse 6, and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Turn with me to Job chapter 25. Job chapter 25. Verses 4 through 6. How then can a man be justified with God, or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon that shineth not, yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less a man that is a worm, and the son of man, which is a worm. And of course, Jesus Christ is called the Son of Man. And in the case of the cross, he's thinking this. <laughs> I'm a worm. Now, what's the import here? On the cross, Jesus Christ cried out, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where are you, God? Underneath the base of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God came to Adam and said, Where are you, Adam? A man who has been crushed and conquered by the python and bitten with sin hides from God and God has to seek him. 
but a person on the cross who is right with God. And even though he is unjustly punished, but he knows the, the system, he's come to do the will of God. When God forsook him, he still maintained his righteousness. Oh God, where are you? Volitionally, Adam didn't want God. God had to call for him. Volitionally, Jesus as man on the cross in the worst of conditions wanted God. There's the picture. Now, secondly, Lucifer in his heart said, I will be like God. But Jesus Christ didn't have any ideas of self-promotion. He said, if God wants me to be a worm, I'm a worm. Now, the worm there, Tola'ath, the Tola worm, the crimson and scarlet grub, technical name, Coccus illicus. What did they do? They would attach themselves to a tree. They would feed off its sap. They would become fertile and cover their eggs with red matter that was used later as a red dye. But it had to give up its life by being crushed. Python didn't crush Christ, but the Father did, for it pleased the Lord to bruise him. If you want a tree ornament, you got to put a worm up there. Worm theology. Why would he die for such a worm as I? Because man is a worm. And he became, in effect, taking the sins of every man upon him, the worst of men, condemned, crushed, punished for our sins. And by his, by his blood and faith in his blood on the cross, we are, we are healed. Now let's come to the heart of the matter. What is the heart of the matter? It's very, very simple. We'll draw in our characteristic little marks here. Why did Jesus Christ die on the cross of Calvary? So that the first thing he might do is give you spiritual life. So it's aimed at this. You don't have one blessing from God until you first of all are regenerated. Logistical grace blessings to keep man alive in the, in the um, angelic conflict are not, oh boy, I just won a million bucks, but I'm unsaved. You're not blessed. You've got a curse. Now, I know some of you are saying, I'd like to have that curse for just, just about 20 years, and then, then we'll change it. But I'm telling you, it's not necessarily a blessing if you don't have capacity for it. The next thing he did is aimed at our body. Dying, you shall die. Dying spiritually, you'll die uh, physically. But, uh, but the filling of the Holy Spirit counteracts the effects of the fall. It neutralizes the old sin nature. Now remember what happened at death? Dying, you'll die. You begin to die here. At the tree of lives, he was sustained here. He had no old sin nature and so forth. What does the cross do? The cross counteracts everything that was done at the tree of death. What is the most important thing in life then? First of all, to get saved, then to be spirit filled, then to learn doctrine to sustain spirit filling. Any pastor or any church that does not emphasize this is evil. Why? Well, because that's what the tree of deaths did. Out with God, human good will give the poor a can of, can of beans, and that will save me from my sin and make me feel so good. And, and we pray, oh God, preserve our body. But, but I reject the cross. That is, that is nonsense. That is heresy. That's blasphemy. Because on the cross, if you want to know what Christmas is all about, it's about a python and an adder and a worm. What did Jesus Christ do on the cross? He rejected the crush of the python. Again, he canceled out human good as a viable means of approaching God. He canceled out evil. Why did he die on the cross? So that God might be included. We are so silly as human beings. Uh, how could those, those people get, get salvation? The only way they could get salvation or keep their lives was to eat of the, of the tree of lives. Once they ate of the tree of death, they bought into the good and evil system. But God was out. But the problem is, the only solutions to life are divine and spiritual solutions. 
Secondly, because of buying into good and evil, you sin and acquire an old sin nature. Sin singular here is the old sin nature. Sins is the result of your old, old sin nature. Praying in the power of the old sin nature is a sin. Should I say that again? Going to church and singing songs, teaching and preaching. Being, being a, a stalwart in your community, helping others, being good, but you're not saved and spirit-filled. You are a sinner. The more you do it, the more you sin, the more culpable you are. Why? Because you have rejected God's solution. It is not evil. You've got to include God. It's not human good. It's divine good. And it is not the power of the flesh that glorifies God. Those that are in the flesh do not please him. That's the adder. But Jesus Christ died for our sins. He, he teaches us to reject good and evil, and he teaches us to look to him for power against sin and for forgiveness of our personal sins. He took care of the adder. He was the brazen serpent. Now, the last thing is the worm. If you will, just real quickly here, Turn to the book of Romans, chapter 3. The book of Romans, chapter 3, quickly. Verse 25. The Caucus Illicus worm making a red dye for a a covering primarily for royalty. It was an expensive dye. Only the aristocrats and the wealthy had it. The kings had it. Their scarlet robes and purple robes. 